Hi, so in this video, I want to tell you about sets in Python. So as many of you know, sets is one of the four, let's say, major container types in Python. So you have lists, you have tuples, you have dictionaries, and then finally you have sets. And in my own experience, I was a bit hesitant to learn sets. I learned first list, tuples, dictionaries, and then there was this big gap before I learned sets in Python. And I think the reason for this gap is that I convinced myself that sets are somehow more difficult than lists, tuples, and dictionaries in Python. This is absolutely not the case. So sets are actually rather easy to learn in Python and also they're super useful. So as I said, I just want to give you an introduction to sets in Python, how to create them, how to do some simple operations and some basic methods and show you some very simple applications of how we can use them. This will not teach you all about sets. I'll give you a few more resources in the description of the video, but honestly, it will give you most of what you need. So here I am in an almost new Jupyter Notebook. I have essentially just made some headlines here of what we'll do. First, I'll talk about why you should use sets. Then we'll get on with creating some of the sets. We'll look at some methods and I'll do a final example. So first of all, rather than just jumping into creating sets, I want to motivate why you would actually care about this. For most people, sets are used essentially to simplify code. There are plenty of things that we do will say lists. Then once you involve sets as well, the code is a lot cleaner. So first kind of very small application is to essentially get unique values. So say that I have, let's make a list of languages. Let's make this programming languages. So let's say that we have Python here. We have also R, we have R again, and then we have say Python again, maybe something new. So let's do SQL and maybe C and let's finally do Python. So say these are coming from a voting system, essentially asking people to vote for their favorite programming language. So here you have a lot of duplicated values. You have R two times and Python three times. How do you get the values without duplication? So let me first show you that manually, of course you can do this manually. It's just a bit clunky. So I can say make a new list called unique languages. Initiate this to be an empty list. And then for each language in languages, we can essentially check if the language is already not in the unique languages. If this is the case, we can take our unique languages here and simply append the language. And now, of course, if I print my unique languages, here they are. This is one way of doing it. You can do it with list comprehensions a bit quicker, but still it's a bit annoying here that you have to write this code just to get the unique values. But if you introduce sets, this is almost immediately. So what you can do with sets is to use the set constructor to take in languages. So let's just print this out to see the comparison. And this here is now a set. You can see the difference in the output with the square brackets versus the curly brackets. So now we have this set here. And converting the list to a set essentially automatically removes all the duplicate values. So sets don't have duplicate values, they're automatically removed. So you can see here that you can go from quite a number of lines of code to just essentially a single one by using sets. Of course, this is a super simple application, but even in more advanced cases, sprinkling a bit of sets in here and there and using some set methods that we'll soon look at can really simplify your code and make it so much easier. I am so much more confident that this is bug-free code than that this is. So. With this as a very minor motivation, let's start with creating some sets. And there's essentially two ways of doing this. So this is the syntax for creating sets. So let's make one set corresponding to people's favorite foods and one set corresponding to people's least favorite foods. So one way to create a set is simply to create curly brackets here as you would do with a typical dictionary. But here, instead of passing in key value pairs, you simply pass in elements. So you have, for instance, pizza, maybe taco, and then say ice cream, and finally pasta. Here's the favorite foods. This is one way of making a set. Then we also have our least favorite foods. The other way of doing this is, as you kind of saw previously, to use the set constructor. And in the set constructor, you can pass any iterable. So typically a list is fine. So here we can have some least favorite foods. Say some people don't like tuna. Maybe this also comes from some voting. Some people don't like tomatoes and some people don't like beef and some people unfortunately don't like ice cream. So here we have our two sets. I think it's nice to just print them out. Let me just try to make this a little bit prettier. So here we have our favorite foods. Just copy this and we also have the least favorite foods. 
And here you can see them. Both look like sets. These are essentially equivalent ways of doing the same thing. Sometimes if you already have a list from somewhere else in your program, it's way more convenient to do the set construction as we saw up here in the small example that we did previously. But sometimes it's also nice to make them from scratch by just using this syntax here. One thing you should note, which is kind of confusing, is let me just write it here as a comment. If I write a variable called empty and assign it like this, this here will give me the empty set. So essentially a set with no elements. You might think that, okay, I can use this notation, so I can probably also use the other one. So if I use this, I should also get an empty set, but this is not the case. This is the notation for getting an empty dictionary. So since the last line here could have been an empty dictionary or an empty set, the developers of Python had to essentially make a choice, and this is an empty dictionary. So a dictionary with no keys and no values. So just know that if you want to make an empty set, you should use that constructor here. Also, before we move on, I just want to point out that elements in a set don't all need to be of the same type. So here, they happen to all be strings. That is very natural in applications, but this does not need to be the case. For instance, this could be a one. There's no problem with this. They don't need to be the same data type. You can also have a tuple here. So one, two, three. This is also perfectly possible. This is also perfectly possible. But if you try to play around and add a list inside here, like this, you'll get the type error. And this is essentially saying that this is an unhashable type. So this is not possible to put inside a set. I don't really want to go into the details of this, but just know that you can pass in lists and dictionaries into sets as I did here. Tuples are fine, strings are fine, numbers are fine. So let me just return this here as we had it before with pizza. Like this, now we can move on. Now that we know how to create one of these, it's good to have some methods on them. We don't want these sets to be completely static objects that just records information, but we don't do anything with them. We might want to say add elements or subtract elements from one set from another and so on. And I'll show you essentially four methods for doing this that I think are very useful. The first is adding something. Let me just write method one adding to a set. So if you recall from lists, then adding to the end of a list, you use essentially the append method, but for sets, you use add. Here I could do favorite foods dot add um, maybe chocolate. And you can see here that now we've added chocolate. Something you should also start to notice is that chocolate was kind of added first here and not last. This is actually rather arbitrary because sets don't keep an ordering. So there is no first element, there is no second element, there are no intrinsic orderings for sets. So you might think that you could do something like, yeah, I pick out the first element by indexing at zero, but then you just get an error saying, yeah, this object is not subscriptable, essentially meaning that you can't index it. I think the reason they changed the name from append to add for sets is that append, at least for me, gives this intuition that it's at the end of something you appended to the end, while add is more kind of neutral to where you put it. And this is of course because there is no intrinsic ordering, so it doesn't matter. Also here it's nice to again emphasize the thing about automatically removing duplicates. We saw from the motivating example that when you convert a list to a set, then the duplicates are just removed. And this happens every time you add something to a set as well. One way you can check this is just to add something again. Add chocolate twice, run it. We still only have one instance of chocolate. This is adding something to a set. The second method that is really useful is to take the union between two sets. So we have two sets, we have favorite foods and least favorite foods, we can make an all foods by simply taking favorite foods and use the method union here on the least favorite foods. And here you can see all of them. So union just means to take everything from the first set from the second, combine it, and here you have a new set. And again, you don't end up with duplicates. Remember that ice cream was in both. You had ice cream as a favorite food and ice cream as a least favorite food. But once you take the union, duplicates are removed, so you only have ice cream once. But this gives you all foods. There is also a short syntax for this. Instead of writing out union manually, which you can do as I've done, there is also a short syntax that I really like. Let me call this short syntax. And what you do is to take your first thing, favorite foods, and then you just do a bar here, and then you do the other one, and this gives you exactly the same thing. 
Notice that union is what's called commutative. This is just a fancy word of saying that if you have favorite foods, union least favorite foods or the opposite way around. For instance, if you have least favorite here and favorite here, this doesn't change anything, of course. The operation simply takes everything from both of them, combines them, removes duplicates, that's it. Doesn't matter which order you do it in. And kind of complementary to union, there is also the intersection. So the intersection is what's contained in both of them, but not in one of them. I think this is clear if you just do an example here. So I can take favorite foods, but instead of taking the union, I take the intersection like this. And you can see here that I just get ice cream. So again, ice cream is in both favorite foods and least favorite foods, but this is the only one. So intersection picks up those that are in both of them, but not the ones that are in just one of them. So maybe let's call this controversial foods maybe. Let me just have it printed out. There is also a short syntax. So let me just copy this because it's of course almost the same. Now the syntax is not the bar, it's and. And you should read this as I want to think that are in both here and in here. So in a sense, you can think of intersection in the same way as you think of the and Boolean operator. And this here, union is more like the or operator. So again, if you use this, I get exactly the same. So you have union, you have intersection. And finally, for the fourth method, this is the difference. So again, I think the easiest is to just copy this here and just write the difference and see what happens. So here you can see that we have chocolate, pasta, pizza, and taco. So if you go and look up, that's almost everything we had in the first one, where we also added chocolates, let's see here, is almost everything except for ice cream. So the difference has now taken everything that is in favorite food, but removed the things that are also in least favorite food. So let's call this maybe strongly favored and print this out again just to have it so these are the food that are in the favored set but are not in the least favored set and again as always there is this short syntax so here we can now take now we need to have them in the correct order this is really important and now the symbol is minus so here's the short syntax so both union and intersection, they have this commutativity property, it doesn't matter which order you do it in. But here, if you really think about it, this does matter. Because writing it in this way, you take the things that are in the favorite food and take away those that are in the least favorite. But if you do it in the other way around, you get things in least favorite that are not in favor. And this is not the same. Maybe I should just show you by printing this out. Here's the opposite. These are the things that are in least favorite, but are not in the favorites. So let me have it the correct way again. And here also, I think the symbol that they've chosen is really good is a minus. So think of that, you take the things in favorite food and you simply subtract away the ones that are also in least favorite foods. So personally, I use these short syntaxes, this, this, and this, a lot more than I use the method names like union, intersection, and difference, but you can use both. Now I've given you essentially four methods, so this is a lot to take in. Let me just give you a final example of how we can use at least one of these. Say you have a variable called good sites that have recorded, say through an opinion poll, good sites for learning to program. So maybe here you have Udemy, maybe you have Coursera, maybe you have YouTube, maybe you have, let's say, Datacamp, and finally, let's say that you got voted YouTube twice, but also you have a record of which of these are paid. So I think Udemy is typically paid courses. The same goes with Coursera. YouTube is typically free and Datacamp is also a paid subscription model. So here's the paid sites. And now the goal of this small exercise is to find the good sites that are also free. Of course, here we can just inspect them visually and see this, but imagine that this has 50 or 100 or 200 entries, then manually inspecting this with our eyes is not a good idea. So here we can see that these are the good sites, but we want to remove Udemy, Coursera, and Datacamp, so the result should just be YouTube. Again, let's just do it manually. We can just make an empty list. We can iterate through the good sites and then we can try to first to ask if site is not in the paid ones. Then we can go to our good free sites. Let me just scroll down a bit, sorry, and append the site. 
And I might have thought that this was a good idea. But this is not exactly what we want. Because now we get YouTube twice. Essentially iterate over it, see if there are in a paid site, and if not, add them. But now we added YouTube twice, that's a bit of an annoying thing. So what you could do is to go here and look, okay, if site is not in paid sites, and site is not in good free sites already, then we can do this. So this is the way to do it manually. But honestly, if you imagine that you didn't write this code, but instead some coworker of you wrote this code, and you come here and you look at this sentence here, then it's like, oh, this is quite tricky to read. Should have probably have some parentheses here to make it a bit easier, but still it's a bit annoying to read and understand what this actually is doing. But again, with sets, this is super simple. So let's just think about what we want. We want these that are not in this. So this is precisely what I explained with a difference. So let's take the first one. Again, let's convert it to sets. Then I automatically remove duplicates. So just to have it here, then we only have one YouTube. Let's subtract the page heights. And this is kind of it. Let's print it out nicely. So of course here you can either print it out, assign it to a variable, doesn't really matter. But here you can see that you get the same thing in a single line. And I think most of you like me, if you compare wanting to read something like this and just wanting this, this is a lot more readable. Here again, I'm much more certain this doesn't really contain any bugs. It's a lot easier to test and so on. So I think that's what I wanted to say about sets. Again, it's not a complete introduction to sets, but I think this should get you going. And I think you can now, if you just do a few exercises and work with this a bit, and you can now claim that you know about sets in Python, at least the rough outline of how they're used, how they're constructed and some methods on them. If you like the content we're creating here, then like and subscribe, and I'll see you of course again in a future video. Thanks and have a nice day.